All right. Boom, boom, boom. I'm working, I always work and I'm, uh, I'm having a holiday. I'm thundercloud. I'm going on a holiday. I'm going to Minjeriba, uh, which is formerly all known as uh, Straight Break Island, for the Island Vibe Festival this weekend, leaving, and I'll be back for work next week. Yeah, sharp on the, on the dot. Well, uh, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land of the land on which we walk here and broadcast. The Camilleroy and Bambai people acknowledge sovereignty have never been ceded. Uh, as I understand, the treaty is still what is required, needed and asked for, even if um, Miss Palaszczuk, um, you know, and um, today the New South Wales government back out of it you know, that, that almost amounts to a continuation of war, doesn't it, if they say no to a treaty, by, by default. Anyway, just saying the obvious, the Haunted Lagoon, by Thomas E. Spencer. It's a, this is out of uh, the book of Australian popular rhymed verse. From Henry Lawson to Barry Humphreys, by, uh, edited and put together by Tim Haynes. The reason I'm bringing this up is because in just over three weeks we've got the Poets on the Mountain Festival up here in Gaira from the 12th to the 19th of November and that includes the New South Wales or the Australian Bush Poets Association, Auspice New South Wales Bush Poetry Championship. There's both a written section and a performance section. The entry forms for both of those are available on the Australian Bush Poets Association abpa.org.au slash um, events and also the Australian Poetry or Australian Poetry Hall of Fame for one word dot com dot au slash events. So there are categories for in the performance uh, someone else's traditional poetry a modern someone else's poetry, an original written by you, serious poem, original written by you, humorous poem. This is the performance. And in the performance category, there's an open, there's a novice for someone who's never won a competition. And there's also a, an area for youth and Gaira locals to, to join in. Gaira locals meaning, you know, 100, 100 kilometre radius around here. That goes all the way down to Urala and up to Inverell and all of that. And so there's prizes for that as well as prestige of being the first, one, of, one of the first winners of the New South Wales Bush Poetry Championships uh, comeback. Uh, also on that weekend, it's really exciting because on the Friday night we've got the Gaira Poets. On the Saturday we've got the Rhymers Variety Show. And the Rhymers Variety Show featuring the best poets in Australia. Mind, mind you, some of, some of our Gaira poets are the best poets in Australia. Oh, a lot of you. We've had Gabriel over here going off to the Australian Poetry Slam. You got me here who got third in the Nimbin Performance Poetry World Cup in 2017. So yeah, we're all kind of accomplished. We've got George here who's sure has done amazing things in his life and Sky is just awesome. <laughs> but hey, I, I just could say that anyway. And and then Ashley too, who is our literary master. Alright, let's get the poetry on the road. The Haunted Lagoon. Thomas E. Spencer. Who once was a man who came from Bunanoon and a maiden from the town of Kangaloo. And each evening in the gloaming, they would go together roaming down the winding track that led to a lagoon where they'd spoon and talk nonsense by the glimmer of the moon. He was wooden, watery Joey at the star where she waited and attended at the bar he was tall, fair and slender, she was dark, plump and tender. And he told her that her eyes were brighter far than a star, which remark proves just how stupid lovers are. But 
through sitting in the moonlight on a log or meandering mid the bracken in a fog with the glass approaching zero, influenza gripped our hero, which resulted in his talking like a frog or a hog, whilst his cough was like the barking of a dog. And the falling dew descending from the trees with the moisture that was born upon the breeze caused a bronchial inflammation. Could have been COVID. See, our hero's conversation was a cross between a snuffle and a wheeze while his sneeze used to shake him from his elbows to his knees. And he'd sit and caught and spoon until he froze, till he couldn't tell his fingers from his toes. And he'd, yet he'd plead with her and flatter while his teeth would snap and chatter and his speech was punctuated by the blows of his nose in his wretched state. He called his nose his doze. But she positively spurned his fond refrain, though she said she never wished to give him pain. Hot, baked hearts, she'd seen a many, but she wasn't taking any. Then she added that he'd water on the brain. That was plain, and she cocked a little nose up in disdain. So the man from Bundanoon in despair cried, Canst thou be false and yet a two so fair? Burst a two! Ye clouds asunder, flash ye lightnings, boob of oh, thou thunder. It's enough to take a bottle, to you swear, I declare. And the man from Bundanoon then tore his hair. And they parted by the germ-infested shore of the lake that Skylark never wore below and the wild fowl left its waters and the possum changed its quarters so the pool became more silent than before for the roar of that sneeze disturbed the echoes never more for they found his sodden course corpse in the lagoon, where he floated, calm, staring at the moon, and some folks who went there boating said they heard a tissue floating o'er its waters, so they ceased to go and spoon very soon, and especially the maid from Kangaloon. Mm. Yeah. Interesting, eh? A maid from Kangaloo. Right, what else have I got from me? I've got Henry Lawson's Wonderlight. Because it's one I need to remember. Henry Lawson, the Wonderlight. And they heard the tent poles clatter, and the fly in twain was torn. Tis the soil rag of the tatter of the tent where I was born. And what matters it, I wonder, brick, stone, or calico, or a bush you were born under when it happened long ago? And my beds were camp beds and tramp beds and damp beds, and my beds were dry beds on drought sticking ground. Hard beds and soft beds and wide beds and narrow, for my beds were strange beds the wide world round, and the old hag seemed to ponder. T'was my mother told me so, and she said that I would wander where, but few would think to go. He'll fly the haunts of sailors, he'll cross the oceans wide, for his fathers they were sailors all on his good father's side. Behind me, before me, on my roads are stormy, the thunder of skies and the sea's sullen sound. The coaster or liner, the English or foreign, the stateroom or steerage, the wide world ground. And the old hag, she seemed troubled, and she bent above the bed. He'll dream things and he'll see things to come true when he's dead. 
He'll see things all too plainly and his fellows all dry. For his mothers, they were gypsies, all on his good mother's side. And my dreams are strange dreams today, dreams are great dreams, and my dreams are wild dreams, and old dreams are new. They haunt me and daunt me with fears of the morrow. My brothers, they doubt me, but my dreams come true. And so I was born of fathers from where I span harbours are, men whose strong limbs never rested and whose blue eyes saw afar, till for gold one left the ocean seeking over plain and hill. And so I was born of mothers whose deep minds were never still. I rest not, tis best not, the world is a wide one, and caged for an hour I pace to and fro. I see things and dream things and plan while I'm sleeping. I wander forever and dream as I go. I've stood by a table mountain on the lion at Cape Town and watched the sunset fading from the roads that I marked down and I looked out with my brothers from the heights behind Bombay gazing northeast and west over roads I'll tread someday. For my ways are strange ways, and new ways, and old ways, and deep ways, and steep ways, and high ways, and low. I'm at home, and at ease, on a track that I know not, and restless and lost on a road that I know. Henry Lawson, The Wonder Light. All right, I've got one more here that I'm going to do of someone else's and then I'll do one of my own if I even can find the one I want to do but I do know it off by heart anyway I should know it off by heart because I'm going to do it next week or very soon this one is by Udru Nunaku Kath Walker of the Nunaku tribe of Ningeriba now, first Aboriginal poet to publish a book of verse. This was written just after the 1967 referendum where the race thing was put into the constitution by, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the last line's quite interesting. It's called Municipal Gum. Gum tree in the city street, hard bitumen around your feet. Rather, you should be in the cool world of leafy forest halls and wild bird calls. Here, you seem to me like that poor cart horse castrated, broken, a thing wrong, strapped and buckled its hell prolonged, whose hung hair and looseless yen express its hopelessness. Municipal gum, it is dolorous to see you thus, set in your black grass of bitumen. Oh, Fellow citizen, what have they done to us? Mm. Yeah, it's a really lovely piece of poetry, that one. Powerful, actually. All right, so I've got one more for you. And then, Ashley, would you like to come along? This one was written, oh well, it's in my book Last in Nim and it's not any longer pink. It's uh, called Byron Bay. Lightning, thunder, pouring rain. Blue's fest is here, and so is the rain. Wash away the filth and sores, and all those fake hippies on dance floors 
mud and slush, the rain falls down, turning white shoes and dresses brown. Raining on the ship parade, cashed up yuppies all can say, oh, I went to Blues Fest and it rained all day. Windy, blowy, rainy weather washed out, fire and rainy weather. Gamora celebrates the Easter. Excess consumption of beer and pizza. Byron's homeless sent away. You're bad for business, policemen say. Tourists can't see Byron's pain, the homeless people in the rain. In behind the hotel doors, it never rained, the beer always pours. Living rough isn't neat, there's rape and bashing in the street. Byron has a flood of poor. If you can't pay a rent while you're out the door. In the streets, in the pouring rain, tourists all blind to the pain. Oh, look, darling, it's a real dreadlock hippie. Oh, you don't see those much in the city. Byron Bay, what to say? Lovely to meet you girls, have a nice day. Look at that whale, that's a nice hat. Does this dress make my ass look fat? Wash off the sand, that lady's cool. Holiday time, nobody at school. Fish and chips, kiss on the lips. Walk on the street with ice cream. The locals all know it, but they'll never blow it. Byron's a drug smuggler's dream. Cockatoos fly with seagulls and chips in their eyes. Snotty kids tantrum and scream. Lifeguard on the beach and the price out of reach, but all for the pasty sun cream. Byron Bay. All right, Ashley. Welcome up. Yes. Well. What a ramp. What a a world of David and Goliaths we seem to have upon us. I shall uh, read something I just wrote germane to that. Mm. The railway came in 83, up Moonbees, carrying bullet teamsters' ghosts. Across New England's granite swelling plinths. Then the news arrived that General Charles Gordon had felt the Marty spear at Far Khartoum, three years on from thence. And so they built Horbury Hunt's Ulamin Bar and placed high up a stained glass shrine. The squatters looked at and through the window as dervishes slaughtered the Christian Empire's warrior king as they stairwayed up to the second story. Students rush past. Bureau cats weigh up the costs of keeping up a pile of local reddish brick. Mm. My teacher stands before me, half a century back from my uprightness here. I had my lectures, she said, library and bedroom there in the 1940s. Trains roll north with guns, I add now, from the squatter's daughter's poetry. Some years from then, Betty is that for Beatrice, pillows back. Boswell's Life of Johnson in the dawn light on her desk. So she can teach me, down the line from UNE, things of war and the survival things of war. And at the end of that, I just got uh, 1942, 1967, I think we had that chat. Um, I lived in a building called Bulunuma. What was that, Mr. Beard? And I um, had my library and my bedroom and lectures in that building. And a uh, brilliant teacher that she was. People uh, pipped in about her on Facebook over the last week, a number of people saying that she had the most profound impact upon them and certainly did on me. Um, it's interesting that railway came and all the, all the breadth and power that seemed to open up for this uh, line of Australia going north and south, east and west in 1883. And in 1880, 1885, the news came through that General Gordon had been killed at Khartoum in Africa and uh, echoes of present 
situations, I fear. Well, um, what have I been reading? I didn't get to my three trusty sticks yet. I'll just keep them in my hand as one today and say that uh, hypothesis must always lead to implications and uh, testing and parameters. My hypothesis would be, as I said last week, that if you take away the wealthy Western style countries from the south, the southern equation of income and wealth on this planet, if you take away the places that get a bit of a boost and help from our system and look at most people uh, in the south of this planet, they're 40 to 50 times less off than we are, and we have to face that frame to get a picture of what's happening and what is going to happen. So I repeated myself last week and this week, but it's a, a central thing, I think. So there are my three rulers, all in one today. What have I been reading? Well, I haven't. I've been um, lost in trying to analyse what's going on and what is going to uh, happen. Uh, but I've got a uh, college on my desk, and uh, I should say floor, as I tend to live on the floor and look at the roof. And um, I look forward to, I look forward to that. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is one of the most um, interesting figures that the English language has. Startled forth, um, well, here's, a, here's some lines of serendipitous things. God save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why look'st thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. Yes, the ancient mm. mariner. Indeed. And I'll finish with the uh, poem of Thomas Stern's Eliot. That um, when I was a kid at Moulinbar High School, not in one of Betty Beard's classes, but in one of our English classes, generated a lot of controversy amongst tweed kids of 1960 late 1960s, I don't know why. Journey of the Magi, which seems to relate to the poem I wrote about Lord Gordon and um, the uh, mood of my mood. Journey of the Magi by T.S. Eliot. The Magi were kings who came down from great Persia um, to the squabbling tribes of, I don't know, somewhere that the great uh, gurus came down to on camelback. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, a very dead winter, and the camel's gall, sore-footed and refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on the slopes, the terraces and the silken girls bringing sherbet, then the camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn we came down to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a water mill, beating the darkness, with three trees on the low sky, and an old white horse galloping away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern, with vine leaves over the lintel, Six hands at an open door, dicing for pieces of silver and feet, kicking the empty wine skins. But there was no information, so we continued and arrived that evening. Not a moment too soon, finding the place, uh, it was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago. I remember, and I would do it again, but set down, this set down, this, where we led all that way for birth or death. There was a birth, certainly. 
We had evidence, and no doubt I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. Yes, no doubt coming from the mighty empire of the, the Farsi, it was uh, difficult in wretched tribes in wretched desert. So, one of his best, though. Yeah, so as kids, we, we had these long discussions about it in class. T.S. Eliot had some sort of hold over, um, over us. And then, of course, he went on to become such a major pop in some ways with cats. And, now, I remember one day, I think I've mentioned it before on this um, expression, that uh, Mrs. Beard came in and she had three books. And I said, oh, what are those, Mrs. Beard? This was the day we had the conversation about what did you do during the war, darling? And she said, I was in Google, blah, 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 blah. I said, what are those books? And she said, oh, this is the level of intellect she was on. She said, uh, this is a new translation of Bachelard's Fire, which is one of the great texts of the 20th century. She was reading it just as it was put in English. And um, she had uh, Johnson's life of, uh, Boswell's life of Johnson. And she had this big, thick book on What's that? Who'd ever read that job? She said this by an academic at Oxford, um, Lord of Rings. And I said, oh, who'd ever read that, Mrs. Beard? Mm. Okay. Thank you very much, Ashley. Yeah. Do you think, I think Mrs. Talk? Beard, um, James? Sorry? Thank, thank Mrs. Beard. Mm. We all did the other day on this. Ah, uh, now. Have you got anything for us, George, tonight? Mm -hmm. Have you got anything for us? Oh. Sing a song. Sing a song. I could do that whiskey thing. Yeah. Well, well this is the beginning of something that I, uh, I'm working on. And I've got two lines. There once was a cheater, and his name was Peter. He was well disciplined and a world record beater. That's it. <laughs> so far, he once was a cheater and his name was Peter. He was well disciplined and a world record beater. Something like that. Um, and then someone, you get like, you know, why do you take? Things like get things given to you. There's a lot of obligations often that have come un that underwrite thing gifts like, or things that you know like welfare. Like you know that with Centrelink you've got that mutual obligation, like that's written into like law. Anyway. This is just a thought the other day, right? Take money from the government and you become the government's biatch. Nothing is free, as there's always a catch. Conditions and rules, because government money's no gift. Comply, bend over, suck this, suck that obligation. Get my drift? Hmm. Just a thought. Yeah, and that was, um, actually like inspired by sky <laughs> yeah. you, you, you said that you know you, you said it didn't you yeah. you said take money from the government you become the government's bitch yeah yeah, yeah. yeah spend on that yeah our teachers at mobile high in the 60s always used to say the moment you're on a government pension you're no different to a, a greek slave in bc 300. this yeah. is the mm. middle 60s yeah. Old, old British chick used to always say that to us in my group. Don't think the Greek slave was <laughs> Too shame. Yeah. Swimming. If there's one exercise I really love doing, it's swimming. I'm back there now. 
I've swum since I was young and I swam in a pool in France where I broke the ice to get in, just to say I've done it. But mostly it's in the sun, I, I like get to stretch my arms out in a swimming pool, sea, to dive and swim and just float about and be free. Turn off the brain, turn on the power. I could swim if I wanted non-stop for over an hour. Mm. I love swimming. Well, did you? No, you know, no. Sing us oh, a song. Otherwise, we're okay. Well, then you can sing a song. No, we'll do a whiskey one. Okay. We'll do the whiskey one. <laughs> All right, George Neo, come on up. But that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, fine. whiskey is about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could say it's got a bit of a, an Irish heritage because it is about whiskey. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little bit of a song as well. Yeah. So it goes Dry whiskey, dry whiskey, I whiskey, I cry. If you don't give me dry whiskey, I surely will die. If the ocean was whiskey and I was a duck, I'd swim to the bottom and never come up. <laughs> and dry whiskey, dry whiskey, you're no friend to me. You killed my poor daddy, now God, I'm dry me. That's it. <laughs> What about doing a song about a uh, cool zombie, but some other time? Okay. A, vision, a visionary lament of that. <laughs> mm. Imagine a world where everyone, everyone was a social media star. Let's go. Imagine in a world where everyone was a social media star. There lived a man named Vision, who was rather bizarre. Didn't care about likes, comments, followers or fame. Happily lived his life with no social media games. Vision was alone in the dark, walking in the park. Saw a group of people gathered, making a remark. Taking selfies of themselves, influencing health. Laughing, having fun on their virtual matrix shelf. Vision stopped to watch them, empty, lonely in his heart. He wished that he could join in and felt worlds apart. Not a social media star, didn't think he was the best, didn't even have an online persona like all the rest. Vision turned to walk away with one comment through the group of social influencers. Heard him say, so blue. Oh, I'm so tired of this division, said Vision with a sigh. Of all the world pretending, selfish, living a filtered life. As Vision walked off lonely, he heard all their cries. He turned and saw them standing with Tears in their eyes. Me too, said one. Me too, said another. I also feel that way. Vision spoke up and said, I'll be a real friend any day. He took out a bag, said with a smile, I'll take care of the vinyl. Give me a phone to be free of this matrix of social trial. The people joined this Vision's group because he could see Use it for solution where we can finally be free. Vision and his friends started a face-to-face -face community, socialising, humbly, authentically in harmony and unity. The, they created a physical, social network. <laughs> they created a physical, social network where people were connected without the pressure of being socially media directed. Vision's social media-less community quickly grew. It, was, it became a beacon of hope around the world and Brighton knew. It was a place where people were themselves without fear, dropped ego, judgment, hubris, and connected year on year. 
vision had a community. He had found his place, creating a better world with an authentic pace, a world without social media where all could be free to live their lives without anxiety of, what do they think of me? So let's all learn from vision and his wise ways. Let's put our phones down, step outside for a few hours of every day. Let's connect with each other in person, face to face, and create a world where all can be themselves with honesty and grace. It's a bit clunky. Anyway, um, yeah, it was just an idea, um, but it's a bit clunky, and I need to, need to edit and make stuff because there's, there's really long lines and some short lines, and so you're going from different meter, that's all that's wrong with it. That's why I did. Did you get that? No? Well, you just heard the story. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I, I heard it because that's what, for me, in my own musical brain, if it's not like... Then it, yeah, it doesn't work sometimes. Yeah, if I've tried to write it metered and it's not exactly metered right, then it's shit. <laughs> Sorry, that, that, this is my own personal opinion of that poem. Yeah. Because I know I've written some good stuff and I'm like, that's not. Hmm. It's just a new one I've written. Some people may lack purpose, but for myself it is the best thing that I have found my purpose is to make life more colourful and interesting. Fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah that was a thunderclap croak from the week. Gabriel, Don Levy, welcome back. Uh, he's been away around to different parts of the world and also to Sydney for the uh, for the New South Wales final of the Australian Poetry Slam, which I'd love you to tell us about. Thank you. Well, briefly then, um, the Poetry Slam uh, New South Wales final a couple of weekends uh, ago, 20 of us from all over New South Wales, and um, some read their poems, some performed them. Um, there was about five out of the 20 who were over 35 years of age, just by looking at them. Um, and uh, there were five judges, and we were all marked out of uh, 10. Um, the ones who got through to the national final got scores of eight or more. Um, I, I got uh, an average of 5.8 um, and I, I got lots of people um, over 40 coming up to me after and saying very nice but why I didn't get further uh, was because I wasn't very emotional. Um, I did one of my reflective ones um, and virtually all the ones that got through to the next round, and even when I got through to the national final, were very emotional indeed. Not particularly rhyming, but emotional and uh, real or fake first person emotion. Um, my broken heart when I was raped or uh, the oppression of my people kind of theme. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a very interesting experience and the other uh, poetry contestants were all nice and sociable. Nobody was up their own thing, um, at least not in the green room. And, um, mm. So I would I would recommend it as an experience, mm. and um, I would do it again. And uh, it's what with that, and with what's just happening uh, in the world, um, I'm going to explore uh, being emotional, but not tonight. <laughs> 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 Appropriately for this time of uh, the uh, history of the world, I found on the bookshelf um, a book of epitaphs. And I discovered mm. that epitaphs in years gone by, and even in centuries gone by, um, were an art form. And uh, sometimes people only wrote in verse, usually rhyming, not always, for the epitaphs. Oh. And that's all gone. And this book was curated in 1982, um, long before the internet. I don't think the internet's got anything to do with the death of epitaphs. I think that's something else. 
Uh, I think it's one of the things like Jive. It, it could come back with just one film to do it. So I'll just um, take a few, but since um, we're quite early and everybody's been uh, uncharacteristically terse, uh, I might take mm. a little bit longer than I usually do, mm. not, not a lot. So um, let's begin with an epitaph on a dentist, a real one. Stranger, approach this spot with gravity. John Brown is filling his last Empty. Yes. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> and one of my favourite uh, ones that I already knew was what was said about um, Charles II, but uh, I discover an epilogue in uh, this book. Let me read the whole thing out. This epitaph was written for King Charles II by the wit John Wilmot, 2nd Earl of Rochester, at the king's own invitation. Here it goes. Here lies my sovereign lord, the king, whose word no man relies on, who never said a foolish thing and never did a wise one. <laughs> and I've used this about various members of senior management in the uh, UNE. But I didn't know the kickback, to, which is this, to which the king replied, the matter is easily accounted for. My words were my own. My actions were those of my ministers. Charles II. Here's another one. In an Essex country churchyard, underneath this tuft doth lie, back to back, my wife and I. Generous stranger, spare a tear. For could she speak, I cannot hear. Happier far than when in life, free from noise and free from strife, when the last trump the air doth fill, if she gets up, then I'll lie still. What a <laughs> nasty thing to put. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> Another terse one. Unlucky Mr. Lamb from Huntingdon. On the 29th of November, a confounded piece of timber came down, bang slam, and killed I, John Lamb. <laughs> I'm stressed by laughing at death today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Three more. Man's life is like a winter's day. Some only breakfast and away. Others to dinner stay and are well fed. The oldest man but sups and goes to bed. Long is his life who lingers out the day. Who goes the soonest has the least to pay. <laughs> <laughs> and then mm. this one's called The Wish of the Living in St. Agnes Churchyard, Cornwall. Here lies the body of Joan Carthew, born at St. Born at St. Colum, died at St. Q. Children she had five, Three dead and two alive. Those that are dead are choosing rather to die with their mother than live with their father. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Uh, Sigmund and Freud must keep that cemetery clean. Mm. And from a churchyard in Aberdeen, Aberdeen currently flooded. Is it? Oh yeah, the, the whole of that triangular bit of North Scotland is underwater. Mm. Uh, got, uh, not hurricane, but typh not typhoon either. Trop storm, not tropical, right, yeah. Babette. Here lie the bones of Elizabeth Charlotte. Born a virgin, died a harlot. <laughs> she was I a virgin at 17, a remarkable thing in Aberdeen. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well worth reviving that art form. Maybe write epitaphs for each other long before we did. Mm. As an exercise. Um, now, three weeks ago, I did the poem that I wrote when I was uh, 18, um, mm. which I originally called Mass with three S's on the end, and then I uh, renamed 
um, prelude to a shooting in the marketplace. And with that, what's just happened, I'm going to read it again. Only this time I found the middle bit, so it'll make a bit more sense. Last time that page was missing. Here we go. I hate all crowds, everywhere, of any class, of any race. Their drink-induced euphoria brings irresistibly to mind the image of a Soviet tank and submachine guns trained upon the whole fucking crowd. Oh my God, how I long for a rifle. To, through, to fire through your blank faces, to transform you from a live zero to a dead one. You, the cannon fodder of the great. You, the spoiled child crowd, screaming and gurgling. Would to God it was with your blood you were gurgling. Your pasty pink faces, your fixed smiles, your drunkenness, thoroughgoing in its repulsiveness. Silly and giggly rather than amusing. Mildly lecherous rather than sexual. You, the eternal fractions, incapable either of solitary thought or action. You, the half-thinking, half-living forerunners of the brave new worlders. See the young Nordic, fondles a black-haired girl's body. She, smiling, pushes back her forelock and from time to time pats his chest. Oh, for a revolver from the NKVD to shoot you both for the cause of iron reason. Oh, to see the red fluid stain your marble skin and say, see my goddess. There are two less fools, two less wasps living from day to day, two less Morlocks on the Eloy's earth, a sacrifice to you, Felician Queen. I know you, scurvy and wrinkled and democrat, all power rests in the people, you whine. What? Does an army conquer by reason of numbers alone? Strategy and leadership count for nothing. Would be truer to say, power rests on the people. They need magnetising by a leader and an idea, like an iron bar by an electromagnet. Say now, who will magnetise the people? Any offers? Sorry, haven't got the time, says one. Haven't got the guts, says another. Haven't got the skin, says the black. Haven't got the nose, says the Jew. Says the poet, let the people magnetise themselves. <laughs> I've got my own problems and despise others. Besides, a magnetised multitude means war. War, the great leveller. You're all equal in the fucking army, in the ranks that is. Jeez, what a sense of comradeship I felt. Slurping cocoa with the palms of midnight while we sang about Hitler's one ball. The illusory symbiosis of enforced cooperation. Fellowship of the trenches and the gutter. You, the masses. You, the fat contented majority. You, the trying hard to become assimilated. The converted Jew, the public school Zulu. You are the little molecules of water. Mm that the tidal waves of history move, foam and dash. <sighs> mm. We have fucking last one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about it? Keep going. And it's something, it, it, the last, very last line, it, it, it's something like, why should, what have you ever done for your leaders? Why should they heal your problems? You pusillanimous silt of time. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, last, last time I, met, I, I left up. <laughs> the middle of time was something like that. Freudian slip. Schopenhauer meets Nietzsche meets Heidegger. Uh, uh, 18, I must have been channeling something or someone. Did you write that when you were 18? 18, yeah. Mm -hmm. No way. Yeah, you know, I wasn't even at university at the time, I was just in between school and uni. Yeah. Um, but. Was uh, that when you used to talk to Joe Orton down on the docks? Uh, I actually met that guy. And, and his love. You met Joe Walter? Yeah. Yeah. I went to Cambridge and met everybody. So, uh, my whole <coughs> life has been one of spectating famous and richer and happier people <coughs> than myself. Great writer. The great spectator. Joe Walton is a great writer. <laughs> and then mm. finally, I, I'm going to, because of the very black mood of that last one, I'm going to mm. do again my one about. Um, um, seeing good in people. Uh, 
uh, that I wrote in Krakow last year. In the last 200 years, we have multiplied our tears. Each advance in our technology failed to improve our psychology. As we boosted our velocity, we made fresh hells with cruel atrocity. How, this is, it gets better. How could any fair onlooker see progress in Earth's pressure cooker? Yes, we took men to the moon. Yes, we will return there soon. Yes, the Nazis were defeated, sort of. Yes, bacterial foes retreated. And women from oppression rose, and support for greening grows. But tell me why, you happy chappy, why are so many so unhappy? Mm -hmm. To focus on it makes me sad. <laughs> People seem to get so bad. Easy to believe the worst of each encounter. Cursed, we smell the foul black smoke from mocking mouths of ruling folk. We have built up new protection to stop malevolent detection. We hide ourselves behind our screens. Shielding from mere threats of screams, distance ourselves from scenes of slaughter, throwing our baby with bath water. I ask through this dystopian pain, can we experience warmth again? Can we detect among the rubble people who transcend their trouble? Could we in our daily living find pleasure in just simply giving? Could we, like the Polish nation, through compassion, gain salvation, this was last year. Sometime, somehow, may we see authentic good in you and me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There we are. There you, go. There you, go. you wrote that other, other pain when you were 18 years old. Ah. May 1964. Mm. 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 The hit of the hit on the radio at the time was even of destruction. Hmm? Okay. Oh. All right. Well, Ashley walked in tonight. Good night. Good night. We'll go home. And, and um, she gave us okay. a book here called The Bay and Paddy Book <laughs> by Fernley Morris. What an odd thing that is. Melbourne University Press. What year was that published? Uh, uh, Between the wars, wouldn't it be? First edition, 1917. <laughs> oh. This reprint, December 1944. Mm. Yeah, still between the wars. So yeah, it's um, it's actually well bound too, with string. Mm. Right, nonsense, immortal. No, I'm not going to do that one. I'm going to do another one over here. <laughs> Coming of Bay. Bay doesn't stay in the stars anymore. He didn't much cry nor care when God pushed him out of a big star door into the everywhere. I ringed him up on the telephone and down he flied to me. Didn't you know how Bay came home? I got the pushcart seat and wheeled him in the front yard door just one way and another. I didn't make mud marks on the floor or scratch the paint on the front way door because I'm a careful brother. I put him in a new white cot. I covered him up till he grew quite hot and then called mother to see. So Bay doesn't stay in the stars anymore but only with mother and me. Hmm. So this is a, a book of children's verse. Baby song. The grandmas both had worried eyes and said it was a shame. Nobody wanted Littley then before our Littley came. Boyo's nose will be out of joint. He's a toddling baby yet. And now there's another one coming along. Poor little pet. But Littley rode through the storm of doubt and the cloud of the troubled brow. Nobody wanted Littley then, but you should hear them now. Very charming. Yes. Voyager. Mm, next one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, um, 
epitaphs. There was a man came in the other day and he said, oh, I write epitaphs. Oh, yeah? He does, yeah. He said, oh, they're really interesting. Oh, I love walking around cemeteries and reading epitaphs. So, yeah. Oh, I'm writing them. Yes, yeah. And he makes a copy of interesting ones. I guess so. Yeah, I like travelling around reading them, but mm -hmm. I never write them. Yeah, do, you so, do you think he lives on back, or is he just far to the Yeah, he lives up towards Glen Innes way. Oh, that'd be mm. that'd be where you'd live. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, up, up on Black Voyageur. Voyageur. What's outside the front door, please? <laughs> Littley creeps and Littley sees nasty dawn at Mac prickled his knees. Littley fold and bumped his head. Boo hoo hoo. Poor little he said, big world isn't as soft as bed. Big wet tears squeezed out of his eyes. Little he shuts them when he cries. Mother came as a kind surprise. What is it fathers and mothers say? Front doors keep the world away. So little boys can romp all day. Boys should wait for a while or more, and whether they're one or seventy-four, carefully venture beyond the door. Kitchen lullaby is the next one. Steady in the kitchen, steady in the hall, don't let the dipper or the gruel pot fall. The old blinds flapping and the little dogs snapping at the butcher and the baker and the woodmen when they call. For the little boy peeping, shh, 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 did the milky make him start? Little boy sleeping, 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 little boy sleeping at his mother's heart. What a lot of noises, carts and buzzy flies. Keep his little hands down, shut his little eyes. For the dogs are larking, for the boys are larking and the dogs are barking. And he can't go to bye bye love, though he tries and tries. Shh, 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 for the little boy blinking, blinking at the fairies who are wanting him to go. Little boy thinking, 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 little boy thinking if he will or no. Rubs his little eyelid to push the sleep away. Better on the lawn it is watching Spriggy's play. Miners and starlings, but no such darlings as the little boy that's never been to sleep this day. Shh, 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 for the big eyes gleaming. Dee, dee, softly his mother sings. Little boy dreaming, dreaming, dreaming. Fluttered, drifted by her bullfly wings. The hanging sword. I used to strike like a warrior, all hot for alarms and games. But I'm a little, I'm not the little fellow I was before the little babies came. Now, thirty mid the city's noise, I pause, I start, I fly. For what would happen to my little boys if a tram ran over me? I missed that one. I, was, I suppose I start to flee. But what would happen to my little boys if a tram ran over me? Hmm. Here we go. What's next? More little boys? No. So many ones about little boys. Here's a father song. They mean such a wonderful lot to me. It's quite absurd. How my soul is smitten with Paddy's who's four and Bay who's three and Sufi, a Persian kitten. So mother must worry and father must fuss, but I'll fake these songs to a sad aversion when manhood steals the boys from us and the bottle pinches the Persian. The 
shadow show. Trains with wheels and clouds of smoke, funny crowds of dodging folk, trams that run along with sparks, sofa games and pillow larks, grubs and ponies, worms and tigers, sparrows on the tree. Oh, what a lot of things for little boys to see. Aeroplanes and paper darts, darts, woodmen driving broken carts, miners on the chimney tops, swallows dodging near the shops, barking pups that make the postman fall down off his bike. Oh, what a lot of, lots of things for little boys to like. Mm. Giant big pictures in big books, pastry from the pastry cooks, circuses and mentone sand, musics of the soldier band, chocolates wrapped in silver paper so they won't get wet. Oh, what a lot of lots of things for little boys to get. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. Danger. The willy wag tails on the wire, the electric light comes through. And if the men turn on the fire, what will the willy do? For what's the good of Amen's learned or ever and forever's? If every one of his bones get bones, then every of his feathers. Cause once there was a cheeky wren who flied away too far and bumped against the moon and then it got burned into a star. The willy hasn't got the sense to mind his itu self, else he'd come on the creeper fence or on the window shelf. Hmm. All right. Well, then I think I'll wrap it up there. I'd just like to say thank you for everybody for coming tonight. Have you got anything so far you want to add? No, sky's not up. Um, and um, thank you to everyone for that. If you're out there in Facebook land, YouTube land, wherever, give it a thumbs up and make, leave a comment like where you are calling from as well. Where are you watching from? Where are you calling from? Oh, my God. All right. Yeah. Don't forget. Um, check out the Australian New South Australian Bush Pirates Association New South Wales Bush Poetry Championship. That's on November the eighteenth and nineteenth. The Poets on the Mountain Festival from the nineteenth to the twelfth to the nineteenth of November. Check it out on Australian Poetry Hall of Fame dot com dot au. Thank you very much and good night. Mm.